Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Elisa Rodriguez Gibson, and it's my honor uh, today to introduce uh, one of our the, uh, featured readers for the conference, uh, Lorna D. Cervantes. Um, Cervantes is a poet who considers the role of writing in the world very carefully. Reading and writing is one kind of work, activism is another. Cervantes has long combined activism and art. She began her publishing career not only as a writer, but also as a literary activist, founding Mango Publications in 1974, at a time when most Chicano writing was dominated by men. She published the now famous Chicano chapbook series and Mango, a cross-cultural literary and art magazine. Cervantes co-edited and co-published a broadside series of women's art and literature and during the early 1990s, she founded and edited Red Dirt, a biannual cross-cultural poetry journal. She also coordinated an annual writing retreat for women of color, providing space, time, and intensive writing workshops dedicated to developing emerging literary voices. She's the founder and director of the Mission Poetry Center, La Misión Poetica, whose website states our mission is to preserve, promote, nurture, and support diverse poetic arts in our community as a means of defining, developing, and enriching the human experience. This statement goes on to articulate a commitment to an embodied and socially engaged notion of poetics that, in my estimation, really characterizes Cervantes' work. A California native, Chicana and Chumash, born in San Francisco's Mission District and raised in San Jose, Lorna D. Cervantes was the former director of creative writing at CU Boulder, where she was a professor of English for 19 years. Recipient of the Lila Wallace slash Reader's Digest Writers Award, two NEA fellowship grants, two Pushcart prizes, another nominated this year, and best book awards for Emplumada, 1981, From the Cables of Genocide, Poems on Love and Hunger, 1991, and the five volume Drive, The First Quartet, 2006, which was nominated for a Pulitzer. Her new books are Ciento, 100, 100 Word Love Poems, 2011. And uh, the, the, there is the, also the um, edited collection of critical essays on her poetry, Stunned Into Being, uh, uh, also 2011, as well as the forthcoming Something of the Cruelest. This year's UC Regents Lecture at University of California, Berkeley. She's at home again in the Bay Area, writing fiction, essays, poetry, and screenplays. So please help me welcome Lorna Lisa Montes. Thank you. Welcome all. It's great to see you. I was just telling my compañero of all the academic conferences, I feel most at home here. So it's great to see you all. Um, I'm going to begin by, um, first of all, thanking uh, uh, Elisa Rodriguez and Gibson for making this possible, and uh, uh, as well as Alfred Ben Dixon and uh, everybody else helping uh, uh, making this possible and uh, inviting me here today. I want to start off with uh, maybe uh, a couple of poems from um, my collection, Drive, the first quartet, which is actually five books in one. At the time, I was associate prof in uh, Boulder, and uh, I had 15 manuscripts in progress, uh, various stages ready for publication. And, and, you know, I wasn't worried about tenure or anything, you know, so I could have had like five separate books instead of this concept. Uh, uh, of this literary pentic, you know, like Hieronymus Bosch, you know, you have three paintings and you hang them together, they each have their separate composition, you hang them together and you see something else you wouldn't have seen unless they were all hung together like these in this uh, uh, permanent gallery hanging here. We went back and forth about whether or not uh, this book was going to be hardbound. Um, uh, and uh, I wanted it in little individual paperbacks uh, in a cardboard box. You know how they get those Louisa May Alcott books? Uh, uh, that's what I really wanted. And you could read it in whatever order. But anyway, so this one is from the first book, How Far Is the War? That's in your drive, the first quartet. 
This is a poem called Bananas for Indrick. One. In Estonia, Indrick is taking his children to the dollar market to look at bananas. He wants them to know about the presence of fruit, about globes of light tart to the tongue, about the twang of tangelos, the cloth of persimmons, the dull little mons of kiwi. There is not a chance for a taste where rubles are scarce, dollars are harder. Even beef is doled out, welfare thin on Saturday's platter. They light the few candles not reserved for the dead and try not to think of the small bites in the coming winter, of irradiated fields or the diminished catch in the fisherman's net. They tell of bananas yellow as daffodils and mango, which tastes as if the whole world came out from her womb. Two, Colombia, 1928. Bananas rocked in the fields, a strip of lost villages between rail yard and cemetery. The United Fruit Company train, a yellow painted slug, eats up the swamps and jungle. Campesinos replace Indians who are a dream, and a rubble of bloody stones hacked into coffins. Malaria, tuberculosis, cholera, machetes of the jefes. They become like the empty carts that shatter the landscape. Their hands no longer pulling green teats from the trees, now twist into death, into silence and obedience. They wait in Aracataca, poised as statues between hemispheres. They would rather be tilling their plots for black beans. They would rather grow wings and rise as pericos, parrots, poets, clowns, a word which means all this, pericos, those messages from Mitlan, the underworld, where the ancestors of the slain arise with the vengeance of Tlaloc, a stench permeates the wind as bananas, black on the stumps, char into odor. The murdered mestizos have long been cleared, and they begin their new duties as fertilizer for the plantations. Feathers fall over the newly spaded soil, turquoise, scarlet, Azure, Quetzal, and yellow litters the graves like the gold claws of bananas. Three. Dear I, the three by six boxes in front of the hippie market in Boulder are radiant with marigolds, some with heads big as my Indian face. They signify death to me, as it is Labor Day, and already I am making up my guest list for the Dio, my Dia de los Muertos altar. I'll need maravillas, so this year I plant calendulas for blooming through snow that will fall before November. I am shopping for no spray bananas, I forego the doll and Chiquita, that name that always made me blush for being christened with that title. But now, I am only a little small, though still brown enough for the where you from 
Probably my ancestors planted a placenta here, as well as on my Gandifas coast, where alien shellfish replaced native mussels, clams, and oysters in 1886. I'm from the 21st century, I tell him, and feel weird, and feel rude for it. <laughs> when all I desire is bananas without pesticides. They're smaller than plantains, which are green outside and firm and golden when sliced, fried in butter. They turn yellow as overripe fruit and sweet. I asked the produce manager how to crate and pack bananas to Estonia. She glares at me suspiciously. You can't do that. I know. There must be some law. You might spread diseases. They would arrive as mush anyway. I am thinking of children in Estonia with no fried platanos to eat with their fish as the blonde turns away, still without shedding a smile at me, me, hija del sol, earth's daughter, lover of bananas. <laughs> I buy a Baltic wheat. I buy a organic bananas, butter y canela. I ship banana bread. <laughs> Four. At Big Mountain, uranium sings through the dreams of the people. Women dress in glowing cemeteries. Sheep clouds gather below the bluffs. Sundown sandstone blooms in four corners. Smell of sage penetrates as state tractors with chains trawl the resisting plants, gouging anew the tribal borders, uprooting all in their path like Amazonian ants, breaking the hearts of the widows. Elders and children cut the fences again and again as wind whips the waste of ancient rock. Sheep nip across centuries in the people's blood and are carried off by the federal choppers waiting in the canyon with orders and slings. A long winter, little wool to spin, medicine lost in the desecration of the desert. Old women weep as the camera rolls on the dark side of conquest. Encounter rerun. Uranium, 1992. Five. I worry about winter in a place I've never been about exiles in their homeland gathered around a fire, about the slavery of substance and gruel. Will there be enough to eat? Will there be enough to feed? And they dream of beaches and pies, hemispheres of soft fruit found only in the heat of the planet. Sugar cane seeks out tropics and dictates a resolution to stun the tongues of those who can afford to pay. Imported plums, bullets, black caviar, large as peas, smoked meats, the color of southern lynchings what we don't discuss in letters. You are out of work. Not many jobs today for high physicists in Estonia, you say. Poetry, though, is food for the soul. 
and bread? What is cake before corn and the potato? Before the encounter of animals, women, and wheat? Stocks high these days in survival products. 500 years later, tomato sized tumors bloom in the necks of the pickers. On my coast, Diablo dominates the golden hills, the fault lines. On ancestral land, Vandenberg shoots nuclear payloads to Kwajalein, a Pacific atoll, where 68% of all infants are born amphibian or anemones. But poetry is for the soul. I speak of spirit, the yellow seed in air, as life is the seed in water. And the poetry of improbability, the magic in the movement of quarks and sunlight, the subtle basketry of hadrons and neutrinos of color, how what you do is what you get, bananas or worry. What do you say? Your friend, a Chicana poet. <laughs> I have my friendly compañero with water. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I woke, I went to bed last night with laryngitis. I had a horrible sore throat. I had a terrible cough. Uh, I was up most of the night with it. Uh, a cold calm, a homeopathic remedy works great. It was a nightmare, right? I woke up this morning with a massive cold, a really, really bad cold. And now you can barely tell if I hadn't told you. <laughs> anyway, I think I want to read this. Um, this is from a new manuscript since Drive, um, and between while I was working on Siento, which is exactly 100 weeks of uh, 100 poems written every week. Um, uh, I was working on uh, this manuscript of love poems to strangers because as I was working on Siento, I was going to this website and getting a word every week. You know, and I wrote a poem, and I, I just knew that it had to be a love poem, and it had to be 100 words, you know. And so for most of that, I don't know, a year and a half, year and three quarters, however many 100 weeks are, you know, I was not actually in love. So I made a comment on Facebook. I didn't have Facebook. I made a comment on Facebook. Um, uh, gee, it's like writing a book of love poems to strangers, you know, because I wasn't actually in love. And somebody from England said, oh, you know, that would make a great manuscript. You should do a book of love poems to strangers. So I've actually been busking for the last couple of years um, uh, where I charge anything from $10 to more. Uh, when I'm at the AWP, I charge 20 uh, uh, where I will write you a love poem or write a poem for your love. I've written one for dogs. I've written one for babies, <laughs> grandmothers. We have a lot of definitions of love, right? Um, but anyway, so it's a manuscript in progress. And, and I, I wrote, really want to read this, which is an elegy, and it was really one of the first uh, poems in this book because it was a love poem to two people who were deeply in love, uh, two poets, uh, two wonderful poets, uh, publishers, professors, uh, Liam Rector and his widow, Tree Swenson. Uh, Liam Rector uh, um, was suffering from... Um, uh, terminal illness and chose to end his life and um, uh, shot himself one night. Tree woke up um, uh, to this. So uh, um, I realized that uh, 
when he committed suicide, it was the hottest day ever recorded in history. Uh, uh, you know, global warming and all of that. Uh, uh, anyway, in a melting season for Liam Rector and Tree Swimson. It's the last week of the melting season, the warmest temperature ever recorded in the North Pole occurs the day the shot rang out silently to the sleeping. A woman drinks a heavy glass of water. A man revs the engine of a shining SUV. The sun cracks upon the land and pours its fine needles of compulsion into the skin. Poetry puzzles a flight of birds. The alien starlings park in the foreign trees. Those that displace, those that move the native stock on. Get off here says something in the shifting of the spheres. In the wolves' hour, a man weighs the waiting and the pain, decides. What single line could ever close this poem? The verses ooze through the wound. The sky opens up into sun. If you could, Capture this day like a disabled duck caught in the muck of our leavings. How many more calendar pages would you venture through? The poems are lost and rediscovered. The woman coming towards you turns into a red shadow a strand of hair floating down to the floor, a goddess of loss becoming. What is to be done when the body is dying? Even, a even in a child, the great thaw continues. In the last seed of summer, before the first rays, a story begins and ends. The birds keep arriving, keep reminding. What wakes, eats. What sleeps forevermore keeps a living hunger alive into winter. How many miles to travel before a setting is begun? How many slushy marshes now must you cross? The creaking ice lets the fishermen fish, lets us in to begin again without you. Uh, I'm sure I once lost a job. I wasn't sure I really wanted because I didn't really want to live there. Houston. <laughs> uh, but it was a forms class and it was a workshop, a graduate workshop, and I went into the class and they were doing pantoums. And, and I was supposed to come in and critique these pitiful pantoons. I mean, there was not a single word, much less those repeating braided lines that are supposed to shimmer and do something when they come back and repeat, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I could, you know, you don't have anything good to say. Don't say anything at all. That's not a good way to apply for a job. <laughs> So instead, I, instead of critiquing their poor little poems, uh, 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 <laughs> you know, uh, and being very honest, which I always am, uh, um, uh, I get launched into this thing about, you know, ask yourself, what is at stake in the poem? You know, the form, the poem is going to dictate the form. 
And the form can have two possibilities. It could be, well, a number of possibilities, but one way of looking at it is sort of like a trellis that this rose bush crawls on and covers it up and grows. It's this organic thing. You know, you don't even, you know, you don't even realize that the form poem is in a form. Or it's like water. You know, what, what kind of containment for water do you need? Well, it depends on the energy of that water. Is it a deep, you know, clear, you know, pool? You know, is it an ocean you can voyage across? You know, is it a, is it a raging rapid? Uh, um, uh, you know, you have to think about form like that, and, and, and it wasn't possible to do in 40 minutes. <laughs> so I lost the job. <laughs> They thought what is at stake was not very uh, um, uh, uh, was not very clear, not very specific advice. <laughs> um, but I wrote a book. I, I wrote a book. I wrote a poem in form that's in this new Penguin anthology of villanelles. Uh, uh, Evie's in it, right? Yes, yes, right. Uh, uh, and some other wonderful people. Uh, Penguin book of villanelles. I wrote a villanelle. And again, the form is a response to, you know, reality. And the reality was the uh, Katrina, you know, the fourth or fifth day, you know, when people are dying, people are still not being rescued, people are, bodies are being found drowned upside down. And Clarence Gatemouth Brown was uh, a, a blues fanatic, um, uh, was found, uh, in a boat wandering around with nowhere to go. Uh, he had lost all of his guitars, his Grammys and everything, um, uh, you know, uh, his publicity and everything, and died a couple of days later, uh, I think, of a heart attack. Um, a broken heart, essentially. Uh, Clarence Gatemouth Brown, of course, from New Orleans. A blue wake for New Orleans, for Clarence Gatemouth Brown. There was a rhyming city on a blue bayou till a wicked wind lay waste. A nothing sound in a city soul and a nothing you can do. There was a windy will and a blue horn you, a single name that was left in haste. There was a rhyming city on a blue bayou. There is a wailing city, a water high, and you left amid the residue up to your waist. A nothing sound in a city soul, and a nothing you can do. There was a loving city and a blue hoodoo through a hard knock school, a river's waste. There was a rhyming city on a blue bayou. A full moon cue, a relation to do, jeweling on a spider's bed so chaste, a nothing sound in a city soul, and a nothing you can do. There is a silent city, a blue shirt crew, the yellow vest of savior waits. There was a rhyming city, on a blue bayou, a nothing sound in a city soul, and a nothing you can do. After I wrote that, uh, uh, after I wrote that, I wrote it, I, I posted a bunch of poems uh, 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 on a site, uh, uh, on a hurricane site, and it was a uh, benefit. Uh, uh, you had to you had to donate like a hundred bucks or something uh, to get published in the anthology of hurricane poems, something like that. So I donated a hundred bucks and wrote the poem and had it published. And then um, uh, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys had a wonderful idea of direct aid to Katrina. I mean, just take water, food, every money, you know, everything down there directly. No foundation, no nothing, just directly. So um, if you donated $100 to the effort, 
in, in any way, form, Red Cross, whatever, uh, he would call you personally. So I got a personal call from Brian Wilson, and I wanted to read him that poem. And you know, Brian Wilson, you, you know, his lyrics, in my room, God, I love that poem, as a young, uh, song is a young poet. Anyway, you know, I, I said, you know, can I read you this poem? He says, you want to read a poem to me that you wrote? I said, yes. He said, that won't be necessary. <laughs> and I kept kind of like begging him, you know, and he kept repeating, that won't be necessary. Until I told him it was dedicated to Clarence Gatemouth Brown. And he said, oh, it's for Gatemouth? Okay, I'll hear it. <laughs> uh, siento, 100, 100 word love poems. Quick, what's your favorite number from 1 to 100? 13. 13, 13, 13. <laughs> 100 words on being done. Uh, uh, and caution, these are like tarot cards, so see if it fits. <laughs> 100 words on being done. I'm done with demons, dying by the dram. I'm done with dealing diamonds from my hand. Done doubting the way destiny pays. Done doubling up on trouble. Done with debits defining me. Dollars dividing me. Done doing it up just to have it undone. Done denying the outcome. I'm done. I want bread and your red arabesques on my neck. I want the guards at my borders to grant you entry. I want to enter your bed, lay down your arms, speak you when spoken to. I want to be your native tongue, your native touch, your single braid undone. <laughs> Another number. Um, 100 words on the resourcefulness of loving you. Love, because these are not just love poems, but anti-love poems. That's always been a working uh, title in my head, I think, since I was about 14 years old. Uh, love and anti-love poems. 100 words on the resourcefulness of loving you. Loving you takes some resourcefulness. A picking up of sticks and stones, the crumbling bones of an imagined future. If I were to love you, I would leave myself behind, hide away in my nutshell of cowering, remembering the long night of some new beginning. I gather my resources my humble pie, my few fallen feathers, the expression I glean from rocks or the heart's river. I could flow with you no more. I've come to the confluence of breaker and bar, resourceful as Friday, clammed up in my shell of silence. I'm standing on some island, Re, source, resorting, resourcing, outsource. <laughs> Another number, 91. 95. 95. 95. Who said that? 95. 95. 95. 95. 95. I guess I got to about 60 of these, and I, I was posting them anonymously. And, 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 I, and I decided to go back and, and look at all of them that I had done, and I, and I really liked them. And I decided, gee, I could do a whole book of these and just have 100. After juggling 320 pages of five books in one that are really, you know, separate entities, and then, you know, uh, 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 it was such a relief just to deal with chronology. <laughs> week by week, I mean, I can tell my publisher, oh yeah, the book will be done in seven weeks. <laughs> you know, I've got seven more, seven more to do. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so what was that, 95? 100 words to Google. 
<laughs> Again, these are like tarot cards, so see if it fits. <laughs> I'm waiting for your Google baby, <laughs> waiting for your probe, waiting for you to Google me baby, <laughs> waiting for your spell. I want your fingers on my mouse pad, <laughs> baby, your palm between my pages. Look me up, I'll be around, aroused, because you're looking. Look at here, you'll find me splayed, all my information. I want your single click, your sly exit. I want your Google on my keywords, baby, your hand upon my mouse. Interested? I want you to make me give it up. I'm waiting for your hits, waiting for your stylist, baby. I'll lead you here to us. <laughs> Another one, 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 one. 41. For, uh, 37. 37. 37. Uh, uh, do -do 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 -do. Liquor, 100 words to your liquor. <laughs> I was just telling my partner, man, those academics, they love to drink. <laughs> I want to distill you down to your final essence, strain you through the tight sieve of my sense, through the thighs and the back. 40 where I lie and you wait, fermented and fine. I want to age you to a mellow sparkle, woo you with wisps of whiskey and rye, rye little drops left on the flask. I want you any way I can get you. I don't want you to bottle up your heart would or explode in the spontaneous flame. I want you charmed and tendered, heated and biting ever so slightly. I want your liquor, your oozing, you. <laughs> Fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. Do, 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 do. One hundred words for provocative you. Ooh, the universe has got me reading all the nasty ones. <laughs> One hundred words for provocative you. You've got me all provocative, babe. You've got me bearing my assets. Witness my will with you, flash and sass. You've got me bearing arms, my ridges, my valleys, my sweetened avenues, exquisite private views, waiting for you to collect your first turn sweat equity. <laughs> Honey, come and see what you do to me, how you fit the honeyed slip, slip through with you, I'm leaking dreams, wedding to your horn, hanging on my phone. You move me to provoke your provocation, keeps me up all night. Baby, let me provoke you while I'm waiting for your poke. What provocation. <laughs> Second to the last. By that time, I know the next one will be the last one. Uh, I, I like I said I would go to a website and I would never know what word it was going to be. Um, just that I had to write 100 words and it had to be a poem and it had to be a love poem. So this one, uh, the word uh, 99, right? Uh, the word was shelter. 100 words for your shelter. I love how you shelter me, the warmth within your hearth, all that wood you had stored. I love all that wilderness in the heart of you, all that uncut lumber just waiting for my touch. I love the human path of you, 
all that tramping to get there, here, where a river runs through it, a shelter of smoke, of sensuous ribbons of past. Let me demonstrate. I will lay down my arms, play dead for you, wait for your resurrection. Take me. I know a road clear to there. It will get us to where we will last. And another one. What's that? The last one. The last one. Uh, um, the last one in the book. Uh, I, like I said, I would go to this website and I would post anonymously. Mm. And I, and I never really wanted to play along, like, to give a word for the week because, you know, I wanted to be surprised, right? So, except for the end. I knew it was the hundredth one, so I was like, oh, please, please, let me do the word for this week. I've got a word for this week. And, of course, the word had to be last. Um, 100 words for you at last. Um, I want to dedicate this to my compañero, Ed, who's here uh, today and getting this on film. Oh, gee, gosh. Because uh, <laughs> even though I wasn't actually in love when I wrote a book of love poems, I, I was, by the way, I was putting together CDs, in case somebody asks a question and answer, I'll answer now. I was putting together CDs of love songs, like 17 CDs of love songs, just, you know, what, what I had digitalized already, just to narrow it down. But great love songs. And I was alternating them, male and female. And I got really interested in love songs and great love songs like great love poems like Neruda where they're like crystals if you're really into crystals for people who are really into love like some people are into crystals right <laughs> 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 that you can recharge them you 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 handle them in a certain way and you put them under water and you recharge the crystal the energy of the crystal well love songs are like that you know, certain love songs, you know, you, you, you know, broke your heart at 14 or then breaking your heart at 50. And, you know, it's a totally different guy, totally different situation, but same exact words and songs. So I was thinking about great love poems and love poems. So I was interested in writing love poems where I wasn't actually in love. Uh, uh, I've got another 320-page book co collected, selected love poems, actually, uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of depressing at that point in my life to have all of these love poems and not actually be in love. But anyway, I had this idea that by the time the book was out, I would have my compañero at last. Um, and the book was delayed like three years, you know. So like three different guys went by until the right compañero came. <laughs> So 100 words for you at last. And this actually is written to be sung to Etta James's at last. So this is the music I hear. And you can actually sing this. And of course, I'm not. And bless you, Etta James. 100 words for you at last. At last, love has come at last. Last time love came. All it was was quest. At last, a lasting love is guest. A visiting heart came over and lover. It's all I'll ever do, all I can ever see to win your skipped beat for me. Consider this plea, a love you can return to. A sunny name where you can at last turn to. And what am I but the next stop on to you? You know you'll do at last. My love has come again. It's been so long, I don't know when, until I love you last. Um, you are all um, uh, professors and uh, wannabe professors and writers of uh, uh, American Lit. Um, and I have, and so like me, 
uh, uh, most of you uh, have then dedicated your lives, uh, as I have, to uh, uh, finding out who is good, uh, who, who, the really great writers in America. And when I was very young, I, uh, too young to drink, uh, I took it upon myself to publish these writers, to get this work out there. And I founded a little press called Mongo Publications and discovered I uh, uh, was the first person to publish Sandra Cisneros. I found a little poem of hers in a little Latino magazine. Uh, uh, Gary Soto at the time was uh, uh, the editor of Chicano Chapbook series uh, that I had started uh, because Gary loves to write rejection letters. And that was always my hardest thing. So it was a perfect, you know. We, we were totally aligned. There wasn't ever when we ever, you know, we, we, you know, we always agreed on the poems, but he loved to write the rejection letters. So it was, so it was a partnership made in heaven. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, so Ray Gonzalez, uh, um, uh, uh, Alberto Rios, Jim Santiago Baca, you know, on and on and on. Uh, all of these writers were first published by me in my little press that I had in my kitchen. Anyway, now these authors, including 13 of uh, people, uh, 14 people that I published, as well as uh, uh, stu former students of mine, such as Luis Urrea, are now banned. These texts are now banned uh, in the state of Arizona. Wow. And every day there is more and more anti-immigration um, uh, bills being passed, specifically targeting Mexican-American and Mexican uh, communities, certainly in Arizona, uh, the overwhelming majority of these uh, books uh, were written by Chicano authors. Um, uh, uh, the exception is uh, uh, Thoreau's uh, essay on civil disobedience and The Tempest, The Tempest, you know, the, the, the one Shakespeare play I discovered at eight years old or 11 years old and just, you know, I mean, but you know, you, they don't want to rile up the, get the slaves up at eight, huh? <laughs> anyway, so, so it was very disturbing to me to find out that dedicating my life to this literature and now having it be banned uh, in the schools in Arizona. Um, I, I went to Libro Traficante. Uh, it was a caravan of writers and other people uh, smuggling books you know, like narco-traficantes smuggling books into Arizona, uh, going from uh, Texas uh, um, uh, uh, down into uh, Albuquerque, uh, Las Cruces, uh, um, El Paso, uh, Tucson, uh, San Antonio, where I joined them in the Alamo, and if you want to Google me up, <laughs> uh, you can find the video of me going on and on about this. Uh, rabble-rousing in front of the Alamo. Um, this is a poem I wrote for that. It's called a Chicano poem. Uh, Hyatt keeps bumping me off. <laughs> this is the scab hotel, so I won't get into that. A Chicano poem. They try to take our words, steal away our hearts under their they try to take our words, steal away our hearts under their imaginary shawls, their laws, their libros, their libra no señores, no more. They try to take away our spirit in the rock, the mountain, the living waters. They try to steal our languages, our grandmother's pack our magma gartas for their own serfs. They raise the land and raise the constitution, declared others three-fifths a human being, snapped shackles, cut off a foot, raped our grandmothers into near-mute oblivion. They burn the sacred codices and the molten goddesses arose anew in their flames. They tried to silence a nation, tried to send the people back to the four corners of the world. They drew a line in the sand and dared us to cross it, tried to peel off our skin, shipitotex, screaming through our indigenous consciousness. They tried to brand America 
into our unread flesh, the skull and crossbones flying at half mast. They tried to put their eggs in our baskets, tried to weave the native out of us with their drink and drugs, tried to switch their mammy-raised offspring, beaded and unshaven, as the colorless pea under our mattresses in a cultural bait and switch, hook and bait. They tried to take our words, give us the Spanish translation for pain, serve us the host of fallow fields on a china plate, stripped us of the germ and seed, fed us in a steady diet of disease and famine. Where is the word for tomorrow to the dead? When is our kingdom come? They claim our reclamations, our reparations, a thing of our imaginations. I discover this truth to be self-evident. In the beginning, we were here, and I declare us here today and speaking. Thank you.